Hello and welcome to Harlingen CISD's Centennial Celebration Show. This show is part of our year-long celebration of Harlingen CISD's 100th anniversary as a school district. I'm your host, Alan L. Shire. We'll have interviews with citizens of Harlingen with a story to tell. Each guest will share their stories of the early years of Harlingen and the evolution of our public school system. Joining us today is Colonel H. William Carr, Jr. He's a former mayor for the city of Harlingen, having served 11 years from 1987 to 1998. Thanks for being on the show with us today. Alan, it's a great privilege to be here. And uh, as I reflect, uh, Ms. Carr and I and the total family have lived in Harlingen now 41 years. And uh, that's two thirds of our marriage. So we have quite a remembrance of what Harlingen looked like and what the school district was like in 1968 when we arrived. Well, speaking of that, when you first flew in to Harlingen back in 1968, um, do you want to reflect on that a little bit as you flew in, as you, uh, I, I guess you moved from Virginia, is that correct? That, that's correct. We, we were living at the time about uh, five miles north of Mount Vernon, mm -hmm. so that will place where, where we were. And we had been in uh, Washington, D.C. for that period of time while I was still on active duty in Washington, D.C. for four and a half years uh, when we decided to uh, come to South Texas and Harlingen. It's interesting that uh, I do want to reflect on what my first impressions were as we landed, but I think it would be interesting to know why is it that the Card family moved to Harlingen, Texas? Well, first off, I can say very shortly, it's a Marine Military Academy. And I spent our first seven years on the staff of the Academy. And we might talk about that later on. But as we came in on Trans-Texas Airline, we stopped, we got out of the airline, uh, the airplane, and uh, I was shocked to see that the airport for the great city of Harlingen in 1968 was two World War II uh, Quonset huts. And it shocked me so much, I said to myself, I don't know whether I'll ever have any position of influence, but one of these days we'll have an airport that is beautiful, that's large, that's one of the finest in the system, and I hope I have something to do with it. Well, actually, you did as, as mayor, and you, you've really done a lot over the years. You've been very, very involved in our community and the growth. So uh, we thank you for all that you've done. You know, and, uh, you, you've done, me, been involved in a lot of projects. And let, me, let me tell you just a small story about uh, the airport terminal that we have out there today. In uh, 1989, while I was mayor, I'd been elected mayor in 1987, uh, I went to an airport board meeting and they were meeting with architects for a new improvement of our airport. And I sat there as a mayor and listened to these architects who happened to come from Houston. And uh, they made their presentation and the presentation in effect was just stretch the box. There was nothing sexy about it whatsoever. It was going to cost eleven and a half million dollars and I expected the members of the airport board to question what the architects were saying. And having only been a mayor for two years at that period of time, I said, pardon me very much, but would you please fold up your drafting boards? And I said, uh, you guys come from Houston, is that correct? And they said, yes. And I said, well, certainly you've gone to the Galleria and shopped with your wife. And they said, oh yeah, we know all about the Galleria. And I said, well, that's what we want our airport terminal to look like, have that Galleria effect. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, uh, go back to Houston, look over the Galleria, draw up some new plans and come back. They came back in six weeks. And what we have today is exactly with the plans they came back with. The next thing was that the airport board said to me, well, Mayor, that really sounds fine, but we can't afford it. And I said, well, I'm in the banking business and I want to tell you something. I can show you how we can afford it. And I said, if I can convince you that we can afford it, will you do it? And they said, yes, sir. And so I went on ahead and convinced them. We built the airport there's out there today. 
and everybody is so proud about it. As a matter of fact, Herb Kelleher, who was a longtime CEO of Southwest Airlines, when we opened up in 1991, he said, this is the finest terminal on our system. Fantastic. Quote. Well, it is a very nice system. What did the school uh, system look like when you first came in 1968? Substantially different Substantially from the, different. The, the school district we have today. Uh, I believe that schools, of course, at that time, they were not air conditioned. Mm. And uh, that caused a lot of problems with the youngsters in the hot classroom, the teachers in the hot classroom. And a few years after we arrived here, the school district had a bond issue to put in air conditioning and it failed. So a bunch of us had to get together and really work up a good plan to convince the city that it was essential that we put air conditioning in our school district, which we succeeded on the second uh, attempt. Beyond that, the facilities were not in the same outstanding condition that they are today. Uh, the staff wasn't as large, as organized, as equipped, as educated as they are today. Uh, you look at this headquarters facility that used to be a Kroger store and see what the school district headquarters is like. It's marvelous. Uh, we have had so many schools that uh, are evaluated in the top level. We're working now under the current superintendent uh, to become an outstanding school district, and I'm certain that we will be. The school district is much more involved and its board involved with the city commission and what's going on in the city than it was back in the 60s. And I believe that's good. Uh, the community has supported the school district for everything it needs. Uh, we've just completed improvements along with the school district on Bogus Stadium, mm -hmm. one of the finest that we have in South uh, Texas. And uh, the quality of education here is far superior to what it was 40 years ago. I know from personal knowledge that uh, my youngest daughter, Patty Ann, who is now Patty Ann Smith and married with her family up in Austin. She incidentally happens to be the president and general manager of uh, KVU up there, which is the ABC affiliate. And you go into her office and she has all these plaques and things of and accolades of uh, accomplishments as being president. And uh, she got started here in, in Harlingen. She graduated from here in 1972 and went on and, and graduated from the University of Texas in Austin in 1975, three years. Well, she's done very well then as a graduate of Harlingen Schools. Well, and, and she's a good representative of Harlingen Schools because being the president of the number one TV station in Austin, she gets an opportunity to, to meet with all of the movers and shakers in Austin, the politicians, uh, the people that run the city of Austin. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, she put out a special on Dr. Sigueroa, who was just selected as the new chancellor of the University of Texas system. And she and Dr. Sigueroa have a very close relationship, as do I. Can you think back on those years and uh, what's changed? I mean. Uh, you know, we can talk about technology and there's all sorts of things. You mentioned air conditioning. Um, are there any other stories or things that you'd like to share with us in terms of what you've seen change about the school system? Well, one of the, the ways that uh, I have been able to stay in close contact with the school district is through uh, the late demise of my daughter, Cheryl Gray, who was a principal for 18 years. Uh, out at Stewart Place uh, Elementary School. And as mayor, I made sure that I visited every campus every year as a mayor to talk with the students about education, how important it is in their individual lives, how they have to accept the responsibility of what happens in their future. But getting a good education was absolutely essential. 
And if they wanted to go to sleep during the class or if they wanted to ignore what the teacher was telling them, it was at their expense in later years. And I think that as I see the graduates today, they're alert, they're intelligent, they're eager to learn, they're committed to what the school district is doing, they're strong supporters of the sports programs, and uh, everything has changed for the better. What would you say are some of the milestones over the years that really made the biggest difference in helping our school system become what it is today? Well, I've always believed that one person can make a change. And we went through a series of superintendents. And every time that we selected a new superintendent, we took a step up. Yeah. Linda Wade was an outstanding superintendent. Uh, Dr. Steve Flores is a tremendous superintendent. He's uh, a motivator. He's a team player. He has high uh, aspirations for the school district. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we would hope that the entire school district one of these days is designated with the highest accolades in the state of Texas for a secondary school system. You know, one of the things the superintendent talks about quite often, Dr. Flores, is uh, being best in the nation. Those are some lofty goals, but when you hear him talk, um, the excitement and so forth that he brings to the table really uh, encourages all of us to be uh, very excited and work extra hard in terms of making that, that vision happen. Well, I'm, I'm always excited when I have an opportunity to visit with Dr. Flores. Uh, his goals and objectives for the school district were the same goals and objectives I had for the city of Harlingen. Uh, during the 11 and a half years that I was the mayor, I can tell you that the cities of Brownsville and McAllen always woke up in the morning wondering what Harlingen was going to do today. Mm -hmm. And we were blowing and going. Wow. <laughs> and so was the school district. Sure. Um, let's look back again to 1968 um, when your, your daughter was in school here. Um, were class sizes the same? Is there anything else about the school system? Um, if we wanted to relate to uh, our audience, our community that might be watching today, uh, anything else that might be different other than uh, some of the things we've already discussed? Well, of course, I don't, I don't have the same close relationship that I had when my daughter Cheryl was still alive, who died of cancer a year and a half ago, and when Patty was in school. Uh, during Patty's uh, period of time that she was a member of this school district, the classes were larger. Uh, the quality of the teaching and instruction, I don't believe, was of the same quality that we find today. I don't believe that there was the high aspirations of being the final school district in the United States was any goal or objective of the school district at that point in time. So I think what's happened over the period of adding new schools, which we've added a significant number, improving every campus that we have, improving the academic menu that these youngsters pick up and, and acquire each and every day, that there is no relationship except for the location of the old schools to what the school district looked like in 1968. No comparison. You know, you mentioned school, uh, air conditioning. It wasn't a fact back in 1968, and that uh, bond election in those early years um, didn't get us the air conditioning. When did the air conditioning come about, do you know? You know, I, I, I wish I could tell you the year, uh, but I don't mind telling you. I'm 87 years old, and some of those uh, uh, dates are not clear. As I recall, when we had the first uh, bond issue, it was followed in less than five years. Uh, and what, what happened to make it successful is that the community got together and found out exactly how important this issue was with the school district. The school district went out and did a wonderful sales job and uh, there was no question that we were gonna have fully air conditioned schools in our district. Um, can you think back on when uh, technology started to become uh, 
utilized in the school district, both in education, for information, communication, and so forth? Well, the start of it was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, I, b I believe by the late 70s, we were just on the tip of really uh, hooking up the school district with all of the technical advances that we have today. As I go through a school and I see the number of computers and I, I see my own grandchildren and great-grandchildren who sit down and are so adept with computers, I know that they have to pick that up in the school system. So I would say I think the crossover was late, late 70s, early 80s. Fantastic. Um, how about what is taught in the classroom? Can you reflect on that in terms of what was taught back then versus what is taught today in the classroom? Well, I think back in the 60s, we were still teaching the three R's. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was basically much more simple in what was being taught today with instantaneous communication throughout the world that there are so many things that current activities influence what goes on in the classroom. Having not visited a classroom in the last couple of years, I would hesitate to say what the basic difference is. Um, were there any uh, mem memorial um, uh, or memorable moments for you um, as a parent having children in the school system? Oh, sure. There were a lot of them. Uh, one of them I want to tell on my my daughter Patty, at the end of the football season, the girls got together and said, uh, we want to assemble a girls football team. And I forget who they were playing against, but my daughter was selected as a quarterback. And uh, we watched the game, they played a good game. And at the last minute, she threw a Hail Mary uh, pass. They made the touchdown, they won the game. And she came back to me and she said, See, Dad, I told you we could play that game, and she did a superb job. They all did. Now, what happened with that? What happened with the, uh, the, football. the, the, the girls' football team? Well, they broke up, but uh, Patty still has football. Wow. wow. Yeah. That is a good story. And she threw a beautiful pass. I guess it was just a natural Hail Mary. Well, we all remember uh, very fondly um, uh, Cheryl Gray and her commitment and um, years and years and years of dedication to our school district as principal at, at uh, Stewart Place. And um, so again, your entire family has made a real commitment to Harlingen and you continue to live in Harlingen. So we thank you for all that you continue to do, even from 1968 till today. Well, the dear Lord has been good. I've been able to uh, remain active, uh, except for remembering specific dates and the like. Uh, I uh, continue to be involved in uh, major activities. I think we'll talk about the RAC later, uh, the growth and development of the airport, uh, the establishment of I-69 as an interstate all the way from Corpus Christi down to uh, Brownsville. Uh, those projects are still very, very active in my mind. And just recently, the governor came into the city of Harlingen and signed a Senate Bill 98, which is going to establish a medical school in uh, Harlingen. And uh, I led up a group called uh, Valley Goals 2000 back in 1981-82. And one of the goals and objectives was to establish a medical school here in the Valley. And I remember the CEO of the hospital, Valley Baptist Medical Center, said, uh, Bill, it'll never happen. And I said, Ben, Mr. Ben McKibbins, I said, if you live long enough, stick around long enough, it will happen, and it's happening. Um, let's go back and talk about the RAC for just a second, the mm -hmm. Valley uh, Regional Academic Health Center. And I know that you had the, uh, the, talk about the vision that it took. Talk about um, when this concept first uh, started floating out there. Talk about the evolution of it. We want to hear about that. We really want to know how did this happen? Because we know that kind of vision is what it takes to see these kinds of big things happen in Harlingen. Well, it is an interesting story, and I hope I don't make it too long. But in 19, 
8182 Valley Baptist Medical Center was involved in a major fundraising effort to raise $5 million that was required to convince the bonding authorities for a $40 million bond issue. And they said, you all have to give your own commitment of funds. Frank Bogus and I uh, co-chaired that fundraising effort. At that time, uh, the Valley had never raised a million dollars for any effort whatsoever. And we took on the effort and organized the community. And between January of 1982 and June of 1982, uh, we raised over $5 million very successfully. Now, having to do that, one of the goals that I had was that we have 100% participation by the doctors, the technicians, the nurses, uh, the administrative staff, everybody that was employed by Valley Baptist Medical Center. Having to do that, I had to go out to the hospital at midnight and stay there until 8 in the morning so I could touch every person that was on that watch. And I did that for a period of two weeks where I got every individual committed, even if it was only one dollar. We had 100% participation. And with the people that I talked with, they said, you know, Colonel, the one thing that we need is we need to establish at some time medical education in Rio Grande Valley. We've got a lot of potential doctors and nurses that live here, that want to go through the education here, stay here and provide the medical help to our citizens. And that really impressed me. And one of the people at that time, I was over at the Marine, or excuse me, at the First National Bank of Harlington, I was president of the bank. And one of the people that uh, would come and visit with me was Senator Eddie Lucio. And Eddie and I got very, very close and we talked about things that the Valley needed. I was asked at that period of time to head up for what is now known as the Valley Partnership, then it was the Valley Chamber of Commerce, to head up a committee of roughly about 100 people throughout the Valley and write a report called Valley Goals 2000. And in that, we had nine ch uh, chapters on various aspects of the growth of the Valley to the year 2000. Frankly, I never thought I'd see 2000 myself. In any case, the 10th chapter, we titled it Visions. And Visions included those big projects, as you call them, that we knew we could not afford. But we put in Visions a couple of paragraphs with regards to a medical school tied with a university system with a first-class airport taking people and tying them in with the university system of, of the state of Texas. That's where the vision started. And upon that, uh, I had a lot of help and assistance by Senator Lucio, who then became a senator. At first, he was a, a, a state representative, a very successful one. And uh, the day that he was providing a bill in the state legislature, to establish a regional academic health center, he called me up, I was a mayor, and he said, uh, I wanna come down to your airport, and I wanna have a news conference in the airport, and I wanna make a major announcement. And he flew into Harlingen, he made the major announcement about establishing a regional academic health center as the first stage. And uh, then uh, five years later, after we established the RAC, here we are, we're gonna have a full-blown medical school. So the whole thing started with Valley Goals 2000. Uh, the surprising thing is that Mr. Ben McKibbins, who was then the CEO, very influential in Valley Baptist Medical Center, uh, retired and now lives in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, when we were designated to have a full-blown medical school, I cut out all the newspaper articles and sent them to Ben and just a week or so ago, I got a telephone call in my office and we've been on the phone. And he said, Bill, by God, you did it. Congratulations. And that's how it really started. If it hadn't been for Senator Lucio, it would have never been accomplished. And then the help and assistance that Dr. Sigaroa did as the president of the Health Science Center San Antonio 
working with the RAC and overseeing the RAC in the first years, who, as I mentioned, is now the chancellor of our entire state system, it would not have moved as fast as it did. The stars were lined up just right, and we're going to move ahead, and we'll have a South Texas medical school by the year 2015. Wow, wow. You know, when, um, when I listen to you talk about the vision, um, you have to dream. You have to dream yes. big. Uh, but you have to see that happening in your mind. You know, just as our superintendent talks about uh, best in the nation, you have to believe that, to say that. And then you have to stick in there and follow it through. And, and you've done so much with the, school, with the, uh, the entire community. Um, so again, thank you for that vision and, uh, and, and the, you know, the perseverance and so forth that really made it happen. Well, Alan, one of the things I learned, and I, I guess, you know, I was 65 years old when I became mayor. And the difference between being in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, or 25, 35, 45, is the difference between intelligence and wisdom. And one of the things that wisdom gives to you is patience. Now, you can't accomplish anything singularly by yourself. Everything that I have been able to accomplish or my name is involved in it, I've had a team of individuals. Individuals like yourself that is so involved in community development. Uh, I think of the growth and the development of TSTC and what it was like when I arrived here. I think about the fact that for 25 years, people had talked about the Los Indios Bridge, but they didn't do anything about it. A week after I was elected mayor in 1987, I called uh, Clyde Fincher, who was a president of San Benito Bridge Company, and I said, Clyde, let's get together for lunch. He said, what do you want to talk about? And I said, the bridge. And he said, okay. And the reason I'd gotten so involved in that project is that uh, while being the president of the First National Bank, the board's meetings were always in our boardroom. And I asked Clyde if I could sit in on the board meeting and just listen. And every year, the report at the annual meeting was the same. Well, we visited Mexico. We've seen the foreign minister. We had a cup of coffee. It was very enjoyable. But there's really nothing else to report on. So in meeting with Mr. Fincher, I said, Clyde, we need a bridge and we need to stop talking about it. What needs to be done? And he said, well, we need to have somebody in public life that's really committed to it. And I stuck my hand out and I said, I'm committed to it. And between 1987 and 1991, we built the bridge. And uh, again, the stars just happened to fall in line. Uh, and after that conversation, we had uh, a uh, well-known family that uh, went down in a private airplane <clears throat> in Mexico. We had to go to Mexico and ask for the governor's assistance in trying to find the airplane. A month later, we went down, we made a public presentation of a plaque to the governor, Governor Burial. And uh, I had asked for a private session with the governor. And uh, I was granted that, I was given 20 minutes. And so after the public aspects, I went into a back room and it went like this. And, the governor and I went in the room and he said, Mayor, what's on your mind? And I said, I want to talk to you about the Los Indios Bridge. And he looked and we talked for 20 minutes and he said, if your governor, who was then Governor Clements, if your governor and I can get together and agree on the general concept of that, you've got a done deal with me. Wow. And he had just gone into office, so he had six years ahead of him. And... Uh, so we got the two governors together. They shook hands. The first promotion that we put out was a brochure of two hands being shook. One is Governor Perriel, the other is uh, Governor Clement. Uh, we then worked with uh, County Judge uh, Tony Garza, who recently has just retired as our ambassador to Mexico, uh, successfully involved in business in Mexico City at the present time. And... Uh, we went up, we visited uh, Governor Clements, 
We struck a deal with Mexico. We went to Mexico City. Uh, they said, we want to build our side of the bridge, and we built our side of the bridge. And in November 1991, we had the uh, ground opening with Senator Phil Graham. Um, are there any other things that you talked about in the, I guess it was the Rio Grande Valley Goals 2000 Committee um, that, that uh, you're still working on, or there's still, that there was a vision at that point that, is, that, that may still uh, come to fruition? Well, the one that I'm working on, as a matter of fact, I'm going to a meeting this afternoon, is we have not completed the I-69 interstate system from Corpus Christi uh, down to Brownsville. But we're getting very close, very, very close. You know, there was stimulus funds that were issued by uh, the federal government here shortly. Uh, we've got another uh, application in we will be doing some work on uh, 77, <coughs> excuse me, and 281. And uh, what our concept is that we need to have two interstates into the valley, one coming down the east on 77, the other coming down on the west on 281, uh, because we've now got 83, which for all practical purposes has been built uh, sufficient to interstate standards. And that's a 20-year system that uh, it took us 20 years to put that system together, and it cost a billion dollars. Wow. And uh, the way we put that together was we took the whole valley, presented our concept to the uh, transportation, TxDOT as we call it, Texas uh, Transportation System, and they said, my God, you finally have got something that you've got everybody involved and they bought it, and they've been working on it ever since. So I-69 is one. Uh, obviously, we're working on the medical school. We want to get the first buildings up on that, working on that very aggressively. And we'll have a meeting next week with a couple of congressmen who are coming down here and see how the federal government can, can help. Uh, we've been working on additional schools, colleges, and universities. Uh, University of Texas in Brownsville, uh, University of Texas at Pan Am, uh, South Texas uh, uh, Community College, uh, the improvements of uh, Texas State Technical College. That's high on our uh, list. And in my present role in the community today, I'm working on those kind of projects every day, but under the radar. Right. Let's go back to the school district uh, for just a minute. And um, there are over a thousand different school districts in the state of Texas. What makes Harlingen CISD unique in your opinion? Leadership, quality of uh, teachers, desire of the board to achieve excellence and recognition at a national level and to provide the resources to do that, which is so essential. There are a lot of people that have dreams and just like Valley Goals 2000, we had to admit we didn't have the resources to do the things that we're accomplishing today. And that report was uh, published in 1982. And so it's taken a number of years. That's why I say it's important about patience but you gotta persevere. You gotta work on it every day. You mm -hmm. can't just let it drop and say, oh, well, somebody else will do it. I mean, if you're committed to make this the number one school district in the nation, you're gonna have to work at it. And as I see Dr. Flores, and I see the people that are in this building, the headquarters, people like yourself, and others that are so aggressively involved in the growth and development of our community, I have no doubts in my mind that in five years, this will be one of the outstanding school districts in the United States of America. Fantastic. That is a vision. And, uh, and I'm prepared to help. Fantastic. Well, we're all going to be on board and we're all going to be doing our share to make sure that we make that vision happen. Well, any way I can help, you know what my telephone number is. Absolutely. <laughs> Can you think, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's take this another perspective at this point. 
What do you think the school district will look like um, in 50 years from now? If you had a crystal ball, what, what do you think that, that it would look like? Well, first off, I, I think that we have to look at the, the large picture. I think that the Rio Grande Valley, north of the river, uh, in that period of time, will be a metropolis of over five to seven and a half million people. Now, when you combine that with the growth and development between Reynosa and Matamoros, they're already at four million. And I would suspect they will be something on approaching 10 million. David Alex, who was the chamber president for 35 years, says, if you put those two communities or those four communities together, that we will have a position in the United States that is larger than San Antonio or Austin. And so you put that together and you say, okay, Harlingen, what part of the valley are you going to be? You look at a map and we are the crossroads of the valley. We're the center of the valley. There are a lot of people that say, well, this ought to be then the, the valley airport. But the way politics are, I think that's a very difficult thing. I think we'll be still divided up by at least two airports in 50 years. I do believe, however, that the medical school is going to be a major magnet. Uh, when the medical school is completed, it will be comparable in its influence in the growth and development specifically of Harlingen as Mayor Cisneros established the Health Science Center San Antonio 35 years ago. Economically, the medical facilities in San Antonio create multiple times more economic growth and development in San Antonio than tourism. And that's what's going to happen to Harlingen. We already see it in the number of clinics that are coming in, technicians are coming in, uh, uh, small schools for nurses and things like that. And, the, and we're going to be the mecca of medical care for South Texas. People flying from Latin America, from Mexico, and so are going to stop off in Harlingen rather than flying over us and going to Houston. And, uh, and that's as it should be. So 50 years out, I think that our school district will have three times as many physical facilities that they have today. I think we'll have a school district of, uh, let's see, right now we're at about 18,000. 18,290, I believe. Well, I would, I'd multiply that by three. Wow. And uh, I believe that uh, everything that is produced, that is built, that is staffed, that is equipped, from now to the future will be first class. And it will all commit itself to being the finest school district in the United States. Well, Colonel Card, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Alan. Your vision, your perseverance again, your commitment to this community has made a tremendous, tremendous difference. And we're all very, very proud of you. We, we know and recognize the impact that you've had in our community. So thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for those very gratuitous comments. I'm not sure that I Great all of that. As I said, I'm a team member. Everything I've done is always to work with a, with a team. And I want to tell you, it's a pleasure to have been here. It's a pleasure to work with the school district. I want you to carry the message to Dr. Flores that at any time, and I've all, always told him, I said, if you want to find out where the skeletons are, just give me a call and I'll give you the background. I'm available as long as the dear Lord is to be able to help and assist the school district. Well, thank you again for being thank with us today. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us today. If you have a story to tell about the early years of Harlingen CISD, please give us a call at 430-9530 to schedule your show here on KHGN. I'm Alan Elshire, and it's been a great pleasure bringing you Harlingen CISD's Centennial Celebration Show. Thank you.